they're going to need the networks, these networks that connect people. So I see some subtle differences in co-living, co-housing, and, and cooperatives. Um, uh, but I suspect that over time, people might choose we'll do co-living for now. Oh, you know what? I'm ready, I'm really ready to settle down. I got a partner. Uh, we're we're going to be together for a while. Um, we've both got good jobs here in Denver. Um, I, I don't need to do that short-term stuff anymore. I'm ready to be in a co-housing place because uh, I'd like to buy in, begin to build up some equity, uh, and I'm pretty settled here, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I, I think... Um, they're, they're, they're all good ideas, and, and I, I love that we're, we're, we're growing in several different kinds of ways. Christine here with another fun episode of the Co-Living Code Show every single Wednesday. It's on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, and also the CEO of Kindred, which is a platform for the co-living industry. And as usual, I want to give a quick thank you to our sponsors that help support this show, starting with, with any place. With the ever-growing demand for flexible living, it is more valuable than ever to find move-in ready housing that fits your needs without the burden of a long lease. Service departments and alternative options like co-living make it super easy and painless to move, relocate, or simply explore a city. And we're honored to share with you the best platform to discover unique and affordable places to live in locations around the world. For an operator, definitely reach out to them if you want to get listed on their platform. And also, thank you to ISL Furnishings, a brand created through Interspace Living, which exists in the exciting space where design meets function. Interspace parlayed its success in commercial-grade unit furniture and conceived an elevated offering. They believe strongly in the co-living industry, and they already work with some of the larger companies like Quarters and Star City. They were founded with the mission to bring your brand to life. Their goal is to revolutionize the unit furniture experience. And driven by creativity, ISL Furnishings believes that interiors should inspire brilliance. Every venue has its own voice. They exist to clarify that voice, interpret your brand vision, and deliver superior quality on time, every time. Today, we have a very special guest coming on. You know, sometimes I find guests online when they're mentioned in an article. This is the case with Jim Stockard today. I recently saw an article out of Boston titled, Will the Pandemic End Co-Living Trend? <laughs> so definitely that was an article I read. Um, Jim made some really amazing points. We have that article in the show notes if you want to check it out. So I'll read his bio and we'll launch right into the episode. Jim teaches about housing at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he earned a master in city planning. He also had a long career in affordable housing development and policy making, property management, neighborhood revitalization, serving nonprofit groups, public agencies, and private corporations at the local, state, and national levels. He also taught courses on housing policy at MIT's School of Architecture. He is the co-author of Managing Affordable Housing and wrote the epilogue in and new Directions in Urban Public Housing. He was also Principal Investigator for the Public Housing Operating Cost Study commissioned by the U.S. Congress. James has served as a Commissioner of the Cambridge Housing Authority for 30 years. <laughs> now here's the best part. Jim was a founding member of Commonplace in 1973. Commonplace is a cooperative that resulted from a group of friends deciding they would like to share a community and live more lightly on the planet. They bought an existing building containing 12 apartments, and over the years, they have modified it into eight homes. Nine of the 13 residents have lived there since 1973. Each family has its own apartment, and there's a shared common room, laundry room, and backyard. Common Place was self-managed for 42 years and has recently found outside management to help run the place. So, of course, nobody on the show has co-lived for 42 years. Um, we talk about the differences between co-housing, cooperatives, and co-living. Jim is so knowledgeable in all of those options and super passionate about creating affordable housing, creating community. We talk about all of that. Such an amazing conversation and so nice of him to make the time to come on the show. So enjoy. Okay, so this week I am very appreciative because I reached out to Jim just yesterday. I saw an amazing article online. We're going to put it in the show notes. Um, it was on Real Estate Boston. It was titled, Will COVID-19 Spell the End of Co-Living, the Co-Living Trend in Boston? As everybody knows, Boston got really hit hard because it's a university town. You've got MIT, you've got Harvard. 
Speaking of Harvard, Jim actually teaches at the Harvard University um, Graduate School of Design, and he teaches on community and design. So we're going to dive all into that. And last but not least, he has been in a cooperative in a co-housing community with his wife for 47 years. So we have somebody that's been co-living for 47 years, and he's going to talk all about that and how they started that. Uh, that's commonplace over there in Boston. So welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you very much for asking to talk with me. Of course. And then first, tell us about that beautiful art behind you. <laughs> well, over, let's see, my left shoulder is a painting that uh, hung in my wife's house as she was growing up. And um, we thought it would be nice to have that when that house closed down. And over my right shoulder is a piece of, I'm not sure, crochet, tad, I don't quite know what, this, what, the, what the particular skill is, but it was done by my, by my grandmother, who was uh, quite, a, quite a wonderful person and a, and a very, very talented seamstress and, and hand worker. So those are two nice things to have up in our dining room. Terrific. Those are beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. The, uh, and my first question right out the gate is going to be talking about being a lecturer at Harvard. How long have you been doing that for? What got you into it um, and your passion about, you know, kind of teaching on this exact subject of uh, building and living in community? Well, uh, I originally came to the Graduate School of Design in 1997. Uh, when, I was, when I was hired to become the executive director of the curator is the uh, title for the position of something called the Loeb Fellowship, uh, L-O-E-B, um, which is a mid-career, wonderful mid-career program for people whose concern is the natural and built environment. So city planners, architects, landscape architects, they come to Harvard for a year. Uh, they have freedom to take any class they want to, uh, talk to any professors, read any books. It's a year off, essentially, in the middle of their careers to uh, find out what the next step is in their in their world. It's a fabulous program. It's the best job anybody could ever have, at least for me. Um, and the dean said, when I took that job, said, say, Jim, I hear you like to teach. Would you like to teach while you're being the curator? And I consider that a big privilege. Uh, and so um, I've taught at the GSD now for 23 years. Um, my work in the world before I came to run the Loeb Fellowship was as a housing consultant. Um, I worked uh, for a small consulting firm, and I worked with nonprofit organizations, public agencies, some for-profit groups at the local, state, and national level on affordable housing policy and affordable housing development and other, other matters like that. So that's what I've taught from. And I don't have a PhD. Any institution that would give me a PhD would be a little suspect, frankly. Um, so uh, it's nice that the GSD makes room for both academics and intellectuals, and for people like me who have a lot of stories from, from our professional careers. So um, I've taught several different courses at the GSD, and, and I'm teaching now a course in housing and urbanization, how housing makes cities, uh, and how cities shape the housing that comes into them, and another course on innovative uh, strategies for solving the rental housing affordability issue uh, in big cities. I love teaching. It's lots and lots of fun. Um, and. Uh, and certainly in my stage in my career, I'm pretty desperate to make sure there are a lot of bright young people coming along to do this work in the future. Nice. No, definitely. And, and again, you had such great points in that article. You know, once they wrapped up the article and published it, what were your, your thoughts, you know, after seeing it published about COVID, you know, and, and the trend of co-living? And we will get into the differences, you know, between cooperatives and co-housing and co-living. Well, I thought the article came out well. I, 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 I'm... Uh, uh, I, I generally found myself to be a, a fan of good journalists, and I think the person who did that work uh, accurately represented the kinds of ideas I have. And, and so I, I liked the article. I thought it was useful. Um, I'm, I'm, I tend to be an optimist in general, uh, and I'm an optimist about, uh, about shared living in a whole variety of ways. Um, and I wanted to say that, and I wanted to say that I think that COVID in certain ways will probably slow down things a little bit, but much more fundamentally, much more basically, it will remind us of what we miss when we're isolated and, and away and, and in our quarantine spaces. And, and th that longing, that desire for community, that, that desire to be in touch with other human beings uh, will, will uh, perhaps explode at the end of this thing when we get through it. Um, and we'll find more and more ways, not only to be in spaces together, but to be in spaces together in a healthy way, which we probably will be better at after this is, after this is over. So um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm uh, 
we may have a little slowdown here for a while in order to be healthy, um, but I'm convinced this will be a, will shine a mirror on the things that I think most, most people are interested in. Great, great points. And I don't know if you have these metrics or not, but do you know how many people and, you know, again, students ended up leaving Boston because they were going to the universities or whatnot, you know, at the onset of COVID? Oh, uh, most universities around the Boston area um, pretty much uh, became online uh, institutions at about the midpoint of last spring semester, which is about when, when we started at being asked to quarantine. Um, Boston has somewhere around 100,000 students at any given moment in the, in the area, not just Boston, but Cambridge, Somerville, et cetera. Um, I would guess roughly half of those folks went home uh, and the other half uh, sheltered here someplace at home. I, it, just a guess. I, I don't really know. Uh, the students in my class, it was about half and half. Some of them uh, took off for, um, for, for their parents' home or, or a place where they hope they might work in the future. Uh, others stayed here because they had an apartment, they had a rent, a, a lease all set, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were squared away. So when we taught our class online for the second half of the semester, about half our students were here in town. We had one student who had to get up at one o'clock in the morning because he'd gone back to China. Uh, <laughs> but he was very brave and strong, and he did it. So. <laughs> nice. And then do, are the universities staying, um, how long are they going to stay online, do you think? I'm not sure. Harvard is going to be entirely online this fall. Um, and so some students will return to campus, but they will come to class online. Uh, other students will not come to campus and will be online from home to reduce the number on the campus. And I, the various universities around the, around the Boston area are making various kinds of, taking various kinds of postures on that question. I don't know of any university that has everybody coming back and we're gonna be in class like the good old days. Um, so it's somewhere between shared concepts, a little bit of online, a little bit of in class, but social distanced. Uh, some are entirely online. Um, so it's, it's, it's a variety of plans. Okay. Depends on the school leadership, depends on the campus, depends on what's available for them. Some schools have kind of spread out campuses. They could, uh, they could, they have large, lots of large uh, meeting spaces. They can, they can social distance in, in, in certain spaces they have. Others are rather cramped, more urban, more con controlled, harder for them to pull it off, I think. Got it. Gosh, and what a bummer those that get accepted into Harvard and not be able to be there in person. And isn't the tuition still full tuition or have they adjusted that? I think they've adjusted that. Um, there are a lot of students at the GSD alone, for example. I know that the last time I heard the numbers, something like 150 of our students had asked to defer their admission. They don't want to come under these conditions. They're going to take a year off and do something else uh, and then start again. So um, I'm not sure. Um, what the school has done about that reduced uh, student body. I think probably the students who are coming, uh, even if online, are paying full tuition. Um, the GSD makes a strong effort to provide um, uh, scholarship aid. And of course, Harvard as a college, the undergraduate school, uh, is among those large, rich institutions that have uh, promised students that they will not leave college if their parents earn I know I think the number may be $140,000. The parents earn uh, less than $140,000. They will leave college with no debt. Mm. So strangely enough, some of the places that are hardest to get into these days are also the places that are most accessible to people of modest needs. Oh, wow. Oh, I Financi didn't know that. Financially, at least. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. If you, if you, if you get into one of these institutions, I think Princeton began this trend. Other schools in, uh, among that elite group of universities whether that's a fair word or not for them, have followed that trend, um, and and they have they have taken their wealth and, and their endowments, and and made sure that people are not chosen for these institutions because they're the son or daughter of a rich family someplace, but because they can do the work, which is which is a, a good choice. Nice. No, that is that's great to hear. And then so let's let's launch into you know let's go back in time 47 years ago when you uh, launched Commonplace. So just just take us back to that journey and and why you wanted to do that and how you guys formed it and so forth. Well, there's 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 one part of this story which is um, going to be puzzling for your listeners, I think. And and I'll, but I'll let me tell you the whole story. Um, all of us that began Commonplace were members of a particular church. It was an unusual church, uh, a church that 
uh, took equal, paid equal attention to matters of faith and matters of social justice. Uh, many of us were people who had come from faith traditions in our childhood where that second half of the equation was not present. If anything, uh, we would have considered uh, those, those, uh, our early experience with the church to be anti-social justice in, in our minds. We came to college for graduate school or college and, and we discovered a place, most of us not so interested in being a part of the organized church again, we found this place uh, and holy mackerel, it really was uh, taking both those things very seriously. Race, immigration, uh, uh, issues of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender equality, all of those things were a part of our life at that place. And as we got to the point where many of us were having to make decisions about where to live, finishing graduate school or ready to move on in some way, uh, somebody stood up in church one, one Sunday morning and said, say, uh, I think I live in an apartment building up the block here. I think my landlord may be about to sell that building. Anybody here interested in buying it together so we could sort of all live in the same building again? Uh, well, she didn't sell that building, but we liked the idea of living together so much that we started searching and found the building we could buy. Um, and one thing that was happening to us, some of your, some of your listeners will understand this, um, we were young couples, mostly with one child or maybe two or about to have a child. Um, and we found that we were seeing each other on Sunday morning or for some meeting of a committee to protest racial disparities. Um, but that was, we only saw each other on sort of, if you will, business occasions. It was very hard to organize a social evening, right? You had to arrange for a babysitter, go pick up the babysitter, drop the babysitter off, go to dinner, then go cut the dinner shorts and get the babysitter, take him or her home. Um, and we said, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we just lived across the hall from each other. So why don't we just buy a building and go live together? And, and we get a little credit for thinking about environmental issues. We were, we were the, the pattern of our lives. These were, we were, um, we were a very, very small dot on the demographic scale. We were all heterosexual, two parent families with either one child or two children. Uh, husbands had a second degree, wives were on their way to a second degree. We were a tiny little, there was no diversity in our group in any way, shape, or form, but we were candidates to get a mortgage and move into the suburbs someplace. And we thought to ourselves, you know, that's not very good for the planet. Uh, that's 10, 12 families occupying a half an acre in a suburb someplace and driving all over creation to get to our jobs. Wouldn't it be better if we lived in the city and if we shared a lot of things so that we occupy a, a smaller a smaller footprint, and so that caused us to buy this building and and begin to try to build a life together. Um, and um, it has been a, a an extremely rewarding experience. Um, our, it was I think that um, in some ways the best beneficiary of all were our children, uh, who not only had two parents in their in their each of our families has a separate nuclear family has a separate apartment in the building. And our kids had two parents, but they had 18 aunts and uncles right around the building here. And so if you wanted to go camping, you went to see Mark. If you wanted to learn to play the piano, you went to see Jim. If you wanted to uh, play out in the backyard, play some sports, you probably came to see me. And, and, and if you wanted to learn to sing, you talked to Sue or Meredith. So um, the kids had quite a, a, a wonderful experience growing up here. And I think they're all very affirmative about it. Um, the second most best beneficiaries, I think, were the women who probably got their careers started about five years earlier than they might have otherwise because we could trade babysitting and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it, people sometimes ask us, do you think this was better than going and buying that house in the suburbs? And we all say, don't know, never did that. <laughs> so um, this has been a, 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 an engaging, a, a, a a positive and a, and, a, and a very rewarding kind of lifestyle. Uh, it, it isn't that we haven't had problems from time to time, um, but we have found some ways, uh, I think we've convinced ourselves that there isn't a problem we can't solve if we're not willing to keep working on it, turn it around, look it up in a different way. Um, and that's a pretty important thing for human beings to figure out with each other these days, that, that, that problems uh, that feel hard, may just be because you're only looking at the problem one way and if you begin to look at it in some other ways there may be a solution if you're if you're interested i can tell you a story about that but but uh, i realize yes. you've got some time concerns. No, go for it go for it we're fine on time well the the one of the first issues was we've got a building and it had 
five so-called larger apartments. That meant they had three rooms that might be used as bedrooms, and the others had two rooms, and one of them only had one room. Um, and so the problem was we had six families that wanted those larger apartments. And we tried a number of ways to try to sort out how we would do that. And any way we did it left somebody out. Uh, and we couldn't tolerate that. Just we didn't want to do that. Um, so finally, uh, my family and another family here in the building, uh, in the group that was forming Commonplace, the two women, my wife and the woman and the other couple, were college roommates. Um, and we were sitting down one night, having a little dinner before a Commonplace pre-organ, pre-building meeting. And we were looking at four plans, and we suddenly said, you know, if we cut a hole in this little space here in the wall, uh, these, the littlest apartment in the building, the one with only one extra bedroom, and, and, the, and the, this next one, which is a big one, um, could go together. And if our families could live in the same space, we wouldn't need all that room, right? We only need one kitchen and only one playroom for the kids, only one living room and one dining room. And that way, there'd be, we were two of the families that needed those larger apartments. That left the other four for the other four families, so it would all fit. We went to Commonplace and said, here's a new way to look at the building. What do you think? Would this work for the rest of you guys? Oh, you guys are all crazy. Are you sure you want to do this? I, you know? and, and we said, well, yeah, the two women have already lived together for a while, and, 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 um, and the husbands do whatever the wives tell us to. So uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it'll work. And it did. They, they were our, they're our best friends. Uh, and, and we lived together for 15 years, um, uh, later moved upstairs. But, but the short story is, we just had to turn that problem over into some different ways to look at it. And, and it got solved. And over the years, we've had some other problems like that, some of them probably worse than, than just physical space. But, but once again, if we just keep talking, keep looking at it, turn it around, upside down, we've convinced ourselves that we can solve any problem. So that's been a part of the clue to our longevity is we just keep working on it. I think that's good advice for, and a great story for anybody listening. Cause I, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that comes up a lot um, in different ways when you're living in community with a lot of different people, um, right. yeah, just being adults and communicating and working through problems. Um, I love hearing that. How many, Jim, let us know how many uh, residents total are there? Uh, there are eight apartments in the building now. The building started off as 12 apartments. I know you have a little interest in design. It started off as 12 apartments, and it's now only eight apartments. Um, so there's been a lot of, of making the, the, the apartment plastic. Uh, to my left is what used to be a firewall, which now has about a 10-foot opening in it to connect two what used to be two separate apartments to make our apartment. Uh, on the other side here is uh, our kitchen, which was in what used to be a, a, a dining room. Uh, and around the corner, uh, we have uh, a, one part of this apartment over here that's now in somebody else's apartment. And over there, we have a stairway, a, a stairway downstairs that connects to a, my office downstairs, what used to be another apartment. So this apartment here is, is some parts of about three apartments from the original days. And almost, I think we only have one apartment that looks now like it did in the, in the, in the days we bought the building. Oh, so the building has evolved. So there were how many residents back so, then and uh, how many now? Uh, when we first moved in, there were 10 families here, 20 adults. Um, two of the apartments were occupied by women who lived here 40 and 50 years. Uh, given who we were, we weren't about to ask them to leave, and they stayed for a few years. Uh, we helped them with the rent a little bit so they could stay, um, and then they moved on. Um, and so at one point, we had 12 apartments occupied, not quite 24, I think 22 adults at that point. Um, We've had a couple of people leave um, and, and apartments combined so that uh, it's down to eight apartments and it's 13 adults who live here right now. Nice. A bunch of couples and a few individuals. Great. And then so you guys raised kids there, obviously. Um, any, any of them stay behind also? It'd be fun to talk to one of them too to, to talk about <laughs> living um, from, you know, just they were raised in that sort of environment. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> our, our friends, Sheen and Meredith, the couple that we lived with for the first little while, uh, their two children live a mile away in the same building. <laughs> one of them upstairs, one of them downstairs. Uh, and uh, so Jean and Meredith's children and grandchildren are within a mile. Um, our children, 
who are essentially brothers and sisters of Meredith and Jen. They all, we all have dinner around the same table every night. So they introduce each other's brother and sister. Our two children live, one of them in Seattle and one of them in Los Angeles. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> With all of our grandchildren. All, so, so you can form whatever opinion you want to about our parenting styles or what have you. But most of the kids are somewhat far away. We don't, we don't, we, we, we I, I've always wondered what it's like for their children, the, what we call the third generation, to show up here at Town Place and say, man, how do all those people know our names and, and know all this stuff about our parents? I don't understand what's going on. I know my, my other grandparents don't live in places like this. Um, but <laughs> That's funny. The, the, most of the kids, I think, almost all the kids would tell you that they thought this was a wonderful way to grow up. Oh, I'm sure. That sounds amazing. And like you said, it's like all these aunts and uncles with, you know, teaching them different things. And there was always somebody to look after them. Like, I'm sure it's just all the shared resources. And, um, almost, every, almost every child in that generation has a very close relationship with some other adult in the building who's not their parent, okay. um, depending on their interests and how, what, how they connected with other people and so on. So I think it's, I think it's so it, it, in some ways, a little bit of a replication of small town situations, right? Where people sort of know everybody in town and your best friend is the postmaster or the person who runs the grocery store or what have you, because you went there for groceries every week with your family. So it, it, it's a nice sort of village feeling, if you will. And then is it, um, I guess just kind of paint a picture of what the building looks like, like how many stories is it? It's a very standard, there, there are a hundred of these around Cambridge. It's a three-story stucco-faced apartment building. Um, uh, built around 1905 um, and uh, very, very conventional. It, it's, um, it doesn't look so conventional inside anymore because of the way we've broken it up, um, but it, it is very conventional. It's, it's, it's three stories, uh, two apartments on the ground floor, three on the second floor, and three on the top floor. Uh, there is a full basement. Um, part of the basement is storage areas. Um, we don't have any less crap than anybody else does. Uh, we also have a big uh, uh, common room, where, which has served an enormously wide range of purposes, where we have meetings. Um, it's where we have had some quite fabulous parties over the years. That room has been a 1950s diner. It's been a Bruegel painting. It's been the Orient Express. Uh, we have some very, very creative party planners here at Common Place. And we have a wood shop where a couple of us do some woodworking from time to time. Uh, we have common laundry area where we all do our laundry. Um, and then a very quite nice backyard, actually, uh, for a building this size in Cambridge. Um, uh, so it, it's, we have a number of common facilities that allow us to, to get together in various combinations. And so the, um, the I was also going to ask the, you know, of course, your, your background is design. Oh, first, the other question I had, sorry, is the, the original adults, did you guys all purchase the building together or did some opt out? No, the, the, the concept of a cooperative, as you probably know, but not all of your, your viewers may know, uh, the concept of a component is that a corporation owns the building, and each of us who live here own shares in the corporation. We own a number of shares in proportion to the square footage we occupy, uh, and our shares in the corporation entitle us to two things. One is to live in one of the apartments of the cooperative, and the other is to vote in the affairs of the cooperative. So none of us own any space. It's distinct from a condominium in that right. In, in that way, I don't own the square footage. Sue so and I don't own the square footage here. But we own shares in the corporation that allow us to live in this particular space. Um, so uh, that meant that everybody who moved in in the beginning had to purchase shares in the corporation in order to generate the funds that we used to pay for our down payment on the building. Um, some, we had a couple of families in the beginning uh, for whom that was a hard pull to, to, to generate that money. Uh, and we had a couple of people who essentially invested in the cooperative. Uh, and rather than give a special, rather than give a loan to that particular family, they provided some funds to the, to the cooperative uh, that sort of substituted for that family's down payment. Um, um, so, so yes, from the beginning, everybody has owned shares of stock and uh, nobody okay. lives in the building that doesn't own shares. Oh, got it. So that was my next question. When they move out, does a new person purchase their, their shares? Right. Right. Okay. Right. And, and to be brutally honest, this, the whole business of financing cooperatives is very, very difficult. Banks don't like cooperatives at all. They don't understand them. 
um, and we've had a very hard time. That there are two, two kinds of loans that get involved with cooperatives. One is a blanket mortgage. If we want to put a new roof on the building, we might have to take out a loan to put a new roof on, and we all pay a little bit of that every month. But they're also share loans. That is, when somebody leaves and somebody else moves in, they have to purchase those shares. And that has, at this point, that's a that's we've gone through several phases on the formula for that. But at this pace, at this stage, that's basically pretty much of a market rate sale. Mm. Uh, it's not very different from what you'd pay if you were buying a condominium in this building. But instead, you're buying shares. And so the person typically has to go to a bank and get a loan for that. And banks don't understand that process. They find it difficult. Where's the mortgage to the property you own? And so we found one or two banks that are willing to do this. But over the years, we've had a very hard time uh, with either blanket mortgages or share loans. Um, and we're beginning to uh, establish a relationship with institutions that will help us do that uh, in order to facilitate that the next time somebody has to, has to sell some shares. And do the shares appreciate, right? They do. In the beginning, um, because of our value system, we thought of this as a limited equity cooperative. That is to say, uh, it's an interesting, by the way, it's an interesting uh, demonstration of the, of the way views on these things change over the years. We were very idealistic. We said, you know, uh, we want people to be able to move into this commonplace. Pretty much we all have told each other now, we've admitted to each other, we figured we'd try this for two or three years and then move on. <laughs> And here we are 47 years later. Um, so so the initial idea was that any appreciation in the value of your shares would be very limited. Uh, you know, your down payment, whatever cash you paid, plus one uh, or 2% a year, consumer price index kind of numbers. Uh, real estate numbers in Cambridge are, out, out, are outlandish. And so if we had appreciation by real estate values, we knew we'd price people like ourselves out of the building in almost no time. About halfway through our existence, maybe it's a 20 year mark or roughly in that area, we began to realize that um, people who were leaving, and we did have one family leaving at that point, that's when we combined some apartments, uh, they were having a very hard time buying a property somewhere else because even after living here for 20 years, they hadn't built up enough equity in our old formula to be able to purchase somewhere else. So we changed the formula to a very complicated thing called the mess payment. Um, which pretty much sort of split the difference between that very low equity buildup and the marketplace um, uh, in order to make it possible for people to move on and, and take some equity with them as they went. Uh, and then more recently, maybe seven years ago, 10 years ago, um, we got to another sticking point. While in the beginning, we had all been very much alike, I described who we were in the beginning. Over the years, that those situations have changed. There have been some divorces. Some people have inherited some money from their parents. Some haven't. Some people have been in, none of us were in high paying professions. We're no lawyers or doctors here, but we've been people in responsible professional professions with have played us adequately. But two of those salaries going together are different than one of those salaries. And some are a little less than some of the others are. And so we began to realize that as we got into our 60s and 70s, that it could be that some people would have some health issues or some need to move to a kind of a housing situation. And if they were not taking enough assets with them, we could be compromising their ability to pay for their health care needs and, and other kinds of needs they might have. And so it felt a little selfish for some of us who were in good financial shape to say, no, 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 we got to stick with our goals here of keeping this low. So you can't have any extra money uh, even after you've committed 35 or 40 years to this enterprise. And so we changed the formula to one which essentially mimics the marketplace. Uh, and then we sort of made a covenant with each other, not a promise, not a legal document, but a kind of covenant that given that Cambridge real estate prices are outlandish and we were going to reap uh, pretty large proceeds from selling a place that we owned for 47 years, that we would encourage people to take 5% of their, of their purchase price and donate it to one of the affordable housing organizations in Cambridge, nonprofits, housing authority, et cetera. So that's our compromise to having what now amounts to market value uh, apartment spaces. Interesting. And then what's the, uh, and thank you so much for breaking that down because I think, you know, even this day and age, you know, people with the co-living, they're trying to figure out a way to pull something off like that. You know, they want to own, they still want to own a piece of something, um, right. but how do you successfully pull that off, you know, with all things considered? Um, and so how do you guys pre-qualify somebody coming in? Well, as you may know, one of the reasons for establishing a cooperative is to try to 
uh, encourage the possibility of the people who are joining you wanting to share the kind of lifestyle that you're enjoying. And so in our case, uh, the critical parts of that are uh, that you're willing to contribute to the maintenance of the building a little bit. We each have a little job that we do monthly uh, to take care of things. Um, uh, that you, you're willing to participate in the, in the meetings and the business of the organization, approving the budget, and maybe serving on the building committee or the garden committee or something like that. Um, and, that and that you are um, uh, going to enjoy life together, <clears throat> not just going to your apartment and locking the door. And so um, in the, in the, we've had one significant transfer in the last seven, eight years. And uh, Jim and Renee uh, advertised the availability of shares. Um, we had one uh, real estate agent tell us, um, you will get, since this is a co-op, there'll be fewer buyers. And therefore, the price will be worth about 20% less than it would if it were a condominium. Another realtor said, no, I don't agree with that, because while you won't have as many buyers, chances are the ones you will have are dying to live in a place like this. They really want a community like this. And so they're willing to pay uh, more for this, or at least what they would pay for something somewhere else where they wouldn't have that community. And that proved to be the accurate uh, story. Jim and Renee got eight offers for the building, all of them more than the asking price. Um, they whittled it down to four. Uh, potential buyers and then we had a committee of commonplace folks who interviewed those people and asked them some questions about the kind of lifestyle we live here and their willingness to share that lifestyle and so on uh, recommended to Jim and Renee uh, a purchaser and they agreed with that and that person is now a beloved member of the community for the last gosh it's six or seven years now it's amazing Karen uh, is is the newest of our members at six years or something like that and we love her to death she's that, that process all worked there is risk in that process as I'm sure you'll understand Christine that the, the danger for, to particularly for such a uh, for such a, a white community as ours is and such a professional community as ours is and such a there are many ways in which the temptation to kind of replicate ourselves rather than seek diversity uh, is very, very strong. And so we try hard to guard against that um, and, and we do the best we can, but um, there's so much built into our, our world, our real estate system and, and our own, our own biases and so on that, that um, we, we remain a, a very non-diverse community. And that's, a, that's an item of sadness for all of us here. No, that's interesting. And so I've had this conversation with other people and let's, you know, definitely I want to launch into kind of the future of community, the future of cities, um, you know, ourselves included, you know, I'm in a, in a co-living home in San Diego, California, and it's all entrepreneurs and we, we love it, but you know, somewhat diverse, but not really. And we're all, it gets almost a silo is what people were saying. You know, it's like, well, you guys are all so much alike. And what if you brought somebody in different that was an artist or, you know, something else, you know, wouldn't that shift the, the uh, dynamics of the group in a good way. And I'm sure, you know, again, we're, we're open um, to anything, but I think you're right. You just kind of get you know, like attracts like, so maybe that's what's happening. So I would love for you to kind of elaborate on that. Well, it, it is it is very hard, and um, I, I I greatly value, and, and this is certainly a value shared by everybody here at Commonplace. We greatly value uh, not simply the idea that somebody with a different uh, tone of skin color uh, is in our midst, but people's uh, lot lived experiences are different in this world, and. We all grow and benefit from being exposed to more of those lived experiences as it educates us um, and as it models uh, good kind of diverse communities for other people. Um, and and I, will, I will acknowledge that there is a, um, there is a, a, a difficulty in, uh, in uh, radical differences uh, in a community. Uh, if, if, if we had somebody uh, here whose who's, um, who's only desire was to be by themselves and who, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to give too many examples, but, but was was very different kind of style of life than we had, it would be hard to form a community with that person involved in it. Um, and so uh, I, I think that, that communities need to struggle to reach out, maybe not radically, but dimensionally uh, to, to embrace uh, people with different lived experiences that still have, there is certainly 
a ton of people in this world who would be entirely uh, at home here and would, would teach us and, 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 and grow our community who don't look like us and who didn't go to the same universities that we did and who don't work for the same institutions that we do. Um, we just haven't found them yet. And so uh, I regard that as a failing on our part to, to look more broadly uh, in, in that arena. And I think it's what all of us need to do, uh, particularly in this area where we, it, this era where our, our consciousness of these matters has been, it has been raised. Uh, it should have been raised, of course, 100 years ago, but okay, it's raised now, so we should pay attention. To it. And then did you, you know, obviously you guys do have a lot of friends and colleagues and probably people you went to university with that heard what you guys were doing. So as they kind of went out to the suburbs and started their families, you guys were doing what you were doing. Like, what were some comments? I know you're already smiling. <laughs> what, were they, what were they telling you? <laughs> Well, we, we didn't get a lot of, of negative feedback from our peers. Um, quite the contrary, I would say more of our peers um, are a little envious, um, frankly. Um, they don't know how they would do this. I mean, I told you that story about our being all from this same church, and I regard that uh, in, in sort of planning terms as, if you will, a sieve, because the, the fact that we were part of that organization, which happened to be a church in this case, but it was an organization where values were very, very important. And so it kind of sifted for people with those values. Um, and and uh, so that, I think, is part of the answer to our success, or at least our longevity, is that we share values a lot. We respect the same kinds of things. Um, and so um, I, I, I think that... Um, uh, we, we, we had, I would say we had more suspicion from our parents who, who, who had raised us in those suburban single family homes <laughs> and who were a little curious about what's going on there. Um, uh, there was particularly big trouble. I'm sorry, funny story. I apologize for taking so much of your time, no, Christine. No. One of our, one of our members, uh, not, a, not who lives here, but was a part of the original group that was thinking about doing this is a fairly well-known theologian. He was off at some religious conference someplace, and somebody said, he was talking a bit about the possibility of this group buying a building and living there, and somebody asked him about it some more, and he described it um, uh, as uh, sort of a little like a shared marriage. <laughs> and that appeared in the religious press. Some of our parents read that. <laughs> and there were a lot of phone calls a few days later <laughs> uh, about what's going on up there? What do you guys... Uh, I will say, however, that as our parents began to meet our friends, began to come here to Common Place and, and see who was here and, and what it was like, they became huge supporters. They were big fans of Common Place. They thought we'd done a wise thing. And, and, uh, and uh, to the extent that uh, any of them would be uh, 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 prone to slap, to pat themselves on the back for raising smart kids, uh, some of our parents were patting themselves on the back for raising smart kids. Oh, that's great. Uh, and one, one other thing I, I might say about this, by the way, um, you may know that, that our generation um, often, often, often had problems with their parents. It was a pretty common experience for people of my generation to have, want to get as far away from their parents as they could. And to a person, almost, almost to a person, I, I should review a little bit before I was quite so hyperbolic, but uh, almost to a person, we loved their parents. They had great values. We respected the work they'd done in the world, and we, we wanted to be like them in some ways. Um, and I think that was part of the reason for our wanting to find other people who shared those values, because we, 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 were, we, wanted, we were away from home, we were away from people who, most of us live, one of our members lived in Somerville next door. The closest next person was in, in, in Hartford, Connecticut, in terms of family, and many of us were from the South, Virginia, North Carolina, et cetera. Um, so we were far away from home, but the idea of coming together in a living situation with other people who reflected that set of values that we felt our parents had had and that we were trying to work on for ourselves, I think was another important piece of what brought us together. Um, I don't want to live alone. I'm away from parents and away from my other colleagues and friends. So. I think that maybe it had been another element that was important in our in our in our coming together.
And then, you know, the, uh, and maybe you've done some stuff. We talked last week with somebody else on the show, uh, Jacob, we started diving into the nuclear family, like kind of why it, it became what it was and then how it's now evolving. So I'd love your thoughts on it. <laughs> well, uh, an interesting statistic for, for you and your, and your viewers, uh, Christine. Um, architects and planners, uh, when they think of the starter home, right? So sort of the first home you buy as you're settling down um, as being planned for uh, a heterosexual couple and their children, two parents and, and one or more kids. That household type now represents 17% of our population. Oh my gosh, that's it. 17%. <laughs> um, you know, it's not hard to believe when you look at our 50% divorce rate uh, and you look at the lateness of establishing families, or we're establishing our families later now, um, you, you look at the rise of single parents, uh, either by choice or, or, or by, by necessity. Um, and so um, I'm a product of a wonderful nuclear family and a member of a wonderful nuclear family. And, and, I, and I, I affirm that, uh, that lifestyle and that set of choices, but I also affirm lots of other choices. Uh, same-sex couples, single parents, uh, grand families, um, whatever works for you um, in, 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 your, in your style. And I think it's important that, our, that our, not only our, our planning regimens, our real estate organizations, brokers, realtors, et cetera, but also our designers begin to think more thoughtfully about providing a wider range of design possibilities for these different kinds of families. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we are occupying space less permanently. There aren't many people who stay in the same place 47 years, no matter where it is, single family home in the suburbs or not uh, anymore. And so the idea that people will move several times in the course of their life and want different families in, the, in, in different spaces in that time, um, uh, the fact that we want different ownership mechanisms at different stages of our lives. Um, uh, I, I think our housing stock must get more flexible um, and, and must get more, um, uh, more able to respond to not only, and we shouldn't kid ourselves, right? The, the fact that we have a different profile of households now does not mean that will be the profile we'll have in 50 years. Uh, and so we need that housing uh, type that we, as we design, and some of our designers will begin to think in these terms. How do I build a building and make it mostly two bedroom apartments now, but in 25 years, it may need to be a lot of one bedroom apartments and some threes or some other combination. So um, uh, less of this uh, requirement of huge can, uh, uh, gymnastics to modify a building and more of the plasticity that we've forced on this building. It wasn't planned that way, but we've kind of, kind of forced it on this building. But one could plan a building to have this kind of, of format. And so uh, I think that's an important uh, sort of next step in our housing design folks. No, great points. And you're right. And design has to change. And if you think of that house, you know, here in the States, you know, from the 50s, you'll see it's just a, a very tiny driveway with a one car garage and it's four bedrooms, you know, for the, for the kids and the parents have their own bedroom and one bathroom because you have family, they're all family members that could share a bathroom. And, you know, just the, just the father has a car and the, the wife is a stay at home. And so uh, mm -hmm. things have changed dramatically. That doesn't work anymore. Right. And so it's just fun to see. And they're all. about to change again in terms of this, I'm sh as we come out of this COVID problem and we will, uh, but as we come out of this, the, idea of working remotely is going to become even more popular. And so now it's, that demands another design uh, change for housing. Uh, do you want your home to also be your remote office? Okay, we can do that. That's one possibility and uh, we can figure that out. Or do you want something a little separate, but not an hour commute away for your office? If you're not going to an office building in the middle of the city, uh, would you like a space two blocks away where you could go and work as opposed to your home. And, and what would those spaces look like? And, and would some of those spaces also have some living attached to them so that some buildings were 80% living and 20% work and some were 80% work and 20% living? So we need to be more and more thoughtful. And, and um, I, think, I think probably going to the design schools and, and checking in on their, 
on their housing studios would be would be a good idea because uh, we we the, the more inventive schools are beginning to try to think more broadly about what housing should be in the middle of the 21st century. I know one of my favorite concepts, I, I don't know if you know him, actually he went to Harvard, he's an architect that went to Harvard, he's in Los Angeles, David Chun, he launched Co, uh, Co House, and they're taking those big, huge, you know, 5,000 square foot McMansions in California, and gutting them all the way out, and making them into like 15 bedrooms, all with their in-suite bathrooms, and then now, which is, an, I mean, they're beautifully done, I've seen them, I've, I've went and toured, and it was just such a smart, smart thing to do, and just recently, he changed, you know, each house, he kind of improves on the design as they go, because they learn things, obviously. And uh, he just by chance, pre-COVID, said, oh, we're making the bedrooms even bigger. And to be honest, I felt like they were already big, um, even bigger, so then they can have like a, their own little office in there. So they have a bathroom, and they have a, a space for desks and bed, you know, so it's, it's all in one. And, um, and again, he just made that was, you know, they did that before COVID. Now that was probably the smartest thing they did, right? Because if somebody has had to self quarantine, you know, they, they kind of have everything they need in their room. So it's really cool. Good, good use of de design for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the, 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 uh, the next step in that process, Christine, is the question of affordability. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because uh, the way our system works, um, those new kinds of spaces uh, will uh, be whatever the, mar the market allocates to them. And our market simply does not provide a home for everybody at a price they can afford. So the next question is how do techniques like that work both for the marketplace and for people of more modest means. Uh, and because the idea is fabulous. It's a much better use of physical space. It's a much better environmental strategy to uh, incorporate the, uh, the energy that's already been put into building that building uh, and not giving it away by tearing the thing down. Um, but we need, we're gonna need to, to uh, spread out the availability of those kinds of good ideas. Have you researched the pod living quite yet? San Francisco, Los Angeles, the pod, kind of the bunk bed living? Yeah, yeah, I don't know much about that. Um, uh, you know, um, I've for a long time been a big fan of the rooming house. I think we really ought to uh, return the rooming house to, to uh, acceptable status. It's sort of like the co-living uh, idea. It just Maybe that's the idea, it's just, Build these things. Forget the rooming house terminology, so we don't bring all those those old old uh, myths back into play, and uh, and just call it co living. Um, do you know? Do you know? By the way, the Citizen M hotels. Yeah. Yes. Very well. Yeah, I know one of the original founders. Even. Yeah. Oh, I've do you? There. Well, I've stayed there. I'm yeah. a huge fan of the, of the Citizen M hotels. Um, I was in Glasgow for six months a little while ago, and uh, uh, we had stayed in the Citizen M. Um, in the beginning of our time there, we, didn't, we lived in an apartment for six months, but I would often just go to the citizen and halfway between me and school, I would go there to do my work. And, and if I didn't have to see any students, I would just work at the Citizen M. Uh, and so uh, I, they, they seem to me to be very much like the co-living concept uh, from a hotel point of view. And I think they're fabulous. Yeah, no, Hans, you'll have to scroll back. It was a while, I think it was last summer, he came on the show. Um, oh, he's good. now the founder of Zoku in Amsterdam. And um, which is like hotel co-living hybrid. And I co-worked uh -huh. from there every day. And it's it's an incredible concept. So yeah, he's a very yeah. talented yeah. individual. Um, always always in innovating for sure. That's great. How funny, small world. Um, so, okay, so that leads straight into the differences between co-housing co and co-living, you know, because co-living is getting trendy, obviously. It's a kind of a newer term, but it's, it's repackaging some of the older concepts. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to explain the differences or kind of your thoughts on how, is it just evolving? Um, are they going to merge? It's that one, I get asked this a lot and it's difficult because <laughs> they, it, it's, it's been, you know, we've reached out to that side and they're just like, yeah, okay, yeah. we do not call us co-living, do not, we don't. And it's just been very separated still. So mm, I would love to hear. A, I know it's strange. That is strange. Um, I'm, uh, I do have a little little gripe with my housing colleagues. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to 
differentiate ourselves from each other. And I frankly think that's a waste of energy. <laughs> uh, anybody who's working on creating a housing stock that is more accessible, more affordable, more appropriate for a wider and wider range of citizens is a good idea. And I don't really care what you call it. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're working on resolving uh, housing issues, um, that's a good thing. Uh, to my understanding, and uh, I understand co-living the least of all of these concepts, but to my understanding, co-living is it has a lot more uh, short-termness to it than co-housing does or cooperatives do. That uh, you, I know that on the information you sent me, you asked me as if I were living in a co-living spot, um, how many people could live here and how long did they have to live here and things like that. Uh, to my understanding, at least, and, and I think that's a, a really wonderful kind of, of new scheme uh, for housing. It's a, it's a great idea. Um, in the innovation course I taught last spring, some of our students independently came up with that as a recommendation for the cities they were serving as, as consultants. Um, the co-housing scheme, to my understanding, is uh, a scheme of more permanent ownership. Uh, some of them are organized as co-ops. Most are organized as condominiums. We have a couple of good friends that live in a co-housing community out in the western part of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I think that it's, it's likely that the trickier part of co-living is the community building with a fairly constantly changing population. Um, co-housing Probably because of its, its an ownership device, probably is uh, uh, more permanent. People look a little more carefully before they choose to move in. They want to know who's there and what the style of life is. And if, if it looks like it's not something that's comfortable for them, they head some other direction. Um, certainly that's true in the cooperative movement is a lot of interviews and people getting comfortable with each other and so on. Um, so it feels to me as though the co-living concept is exactly perfect for some people um, because they have a short-term need, uh, because they make friends quickly or because they size up places quickly. Um, and, and the co-housing model uh, is uh, maybe a, 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 a little more carefully thought out by the people who choose it and the particular places they choose. Um, and so um, it feels like each of them is appropriate for a sort of a person at a different stage of their housing needs. Um, uh, and so I think they're both really, what I'm enjoying getting to know more about co-living. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I do think in our, in our in a, in a culture where younger people move more rapidly. Um, I had a student once that wrote a paper for me about uh, a network of cooperatives, right? where you could be in Cooperative X in Boston, and then your job took you to Chicago, and there would be an easy mechanism for relinquishing your shares in the Boston Co-op and purchasing shares in your sister co-op in Chicago, because you all belong to the same network. Um, so that it was easy to make the switch of shares, and you kept building equity as you went, uh, and rather than having to start all over again when you get to Chicago. Um, and I thought that was a terrific idea. That was a student who got a very good grade on that paper. <laughs> uh, and, and I think we need to continue to network these kinds of organizations uh, so that, that people can find the right. There's an organization in, in Burlington, Vermont, that talks about a ladder of tenure. In their case, um, they have seven different organizations, including homeless shelter, a housing authority, a first-time home buyer program, a mortgage loan program for people buying homes. And, and their, their argument is that anybody who comes to the Burlington area should be able to find a space with one or the other of those organizations. And as their housing needs change, they can move along the spectrum. And, and while that's sort of oriented toward a more service-oriented uh, spectrum, um, it feels to me like similar kinds of connections among, among organizations that provide these various kinds of shared living experiences is a terrific thing. I, I, I've seen, I've looked at the co-living network uh, that has this, uh, I'm sad to say when I plugged in Glasgow, they didn't have any co-living spots for me in, in Glasgow. Uh, but but uh, it seems to me as though that ability to find places in other, in other new communities 
because once you've lived in a co-living situation, pretty sure that most people who've lived that way, if they now they have to move to San Diego, they pretty much want to find that place in San Diego. And they're not going to know how to do that from a standard realtor, probably. They don't need the networks, these networks that connect people. So I see some subtle differences in co-living, co-housing, and, and cooperatives. Um, uh, but I suspect that over time, people might choose little co-living for now. Oh, you know what? I'm ready, really ready to settle down. I got a partner. Uh, we're we're going to be together for a while. Um, we've both got good jobs here in Denver. Um, I, I don't need to do that short-term stuff anymore. I'm ready to be in a co-housing place because uh, I'd like to buy in, begin to build up some equity, uh, and I'm pretty settled here, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I, I think... Um, they're, they're, they're all good ideas, and, and I, I love that we're, we're, we're growing in several different kinds of ways. Yeah, maybe you can connect me with that, that student that wrote that paper, because I've preached about fractional, that would be like fractional ownership. Yeah, 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 own yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a piece of something, but they can access it, you know, through the network if they have yeah. to move. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, I love that. I know I've been waiting for somebody to do that because it makes such perfect sense in this yeah, day and age where everybody's right. jumping around. Um, so perfect. So my last question for you is where do you see, okay, whatever we want to call it, co-housing, co-living, whatever you want to call it, let's just call it community living. If we fast forward good, ten, good. 10 years in uh, 2030, where do you see it? Oh, I think it is going to be a more popular option for a broader range of people. Um, Christine, there is some, from a planner's perspective, there are both pushes and pulls, right? Um, uh, it's important for people to understand the difference between housing cost and housing price. Cost is two by fours and labor hours and insurance rates and taxes. Price is an entirely different number. that has nothing to do with cost, except that price has to be a little higher than cost or nobody will build any housing. And the problem is in our big cities that are popular places to live, our zoning regimens are keeping us from, help, from having supply keep up with demand. And therefore, prices are going to keep going up, and up, and up, and up. Um, and, and so that's a push to find ways to share housing costs. Um, it's also, for many people, an environmental push. This is not responsible to buy myself a single family home in the suburbs and drive an hour each way. It's not good for my time. It's not good for the environment. And we, an increasingly number of people in the younger generation care about that. And so that's a push toward a more shared lifestyle. And I think there are probably some others. Um, people are starting their families later. Um, so they're, when that happens, they're ready, they're, they're, they're ready to have some other option before they're starting their families. Uh, and maybe even there's a location push, right? I, 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 I would like to be closer to my office, uh, and that's in the city, so I need to find a more place I can live. Uh, but there's also a pull. There's the pull for community. I would like to have some friends. I'd like to be connected. I, I, I don't like this isolation. I, 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 lived, I loved a single in college, but I'm ready now to, 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 to have, have some good friends. Uh, it's undeniable. It happens in my class every single fall. I ask students where they grew up, and the answers are of 30 students, uh, two grew up in the middle of the city, four grew up in, in near end suburbs, 23 grew up in the rural, uh, you know, further out suburbs, and one grew up on a farm. Where do you want to live when you're settling down, you know, you buy your first home or you're ready to settle? 23 want to live in the inner city, or 20 want to live in the inner city, six more want to live in the inner suburbs, two want to live in the outer suburbs, and that person from the farm still wants to live on a farm. <laughs> but the short story is, that's just, that's obviously a very unscientific example, but the short story is more and more of your generation and even younger want to live in cities. And so that's a pull to live in, in places because the, the, the push of price is offsetting. So the pull to live in the city is a pull that says, I need to find some way to live where I can share the cost of housing. Um, and, 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 and it's also true that your generation and younger um, are people who have done more sharing all their lives. You share cars, you share bikes, you share homes, you share clothes, you share all kinds of stuff. And so um, those things are all pulls toward a shared living. So uh, I can only believe that one form or another, and we may not have invented all the forms yet, of shared living will become a more and more common experience uh, going forwards. And, and I think that can only be good for our society. Um, we, we, um, the more we know each other, the more we bump into each other, 
um, the less we're able to, to say that's an other over there. Um, and, and as long as we can, uh, we, as we get to know somebody who has a different set of, 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 of qualities than we do, uh, and those were qualities we used to be suspicious of. We say, oh, well, you know what? This person doesn't have all those qualities. And so maybe all the people that are like that have a bunch of different, maybe I should get to know these people a bit more. So I, I, I have to believe that more shared experiences at the living level uh, can only be good for our society. That is such a perfect way to end. I love that push pull. You just explained it so perfectly. See, I want to take, I want to take one of your classes, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you kind? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you just clearly like defined everything so perfectly on this on this interview. So I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Definitely it was great fun. Touch. Thank you very much for having me. Definitely. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. You too. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. And one last quick mention to make sure you register for the Monk Realty Summit 2020. Again, September 1st to September 3rd. Registration link is in the show notes. Thank you so much for checking out today's episode. And if you're looking for more information on co-living, you can check out our published book, The Co-Living Code, on Amazon. And be sure to go to Kindred to check out our online search and discovery platform for co-living around the world. Lastly, a quick thank you again to both of our sponsors. Any place makes it easy to book a flexible, furnished accommodation anywhere in the world, whether it's an apartment, co-living space, or extended stay hotel. And also ISL Furnishings, trust your unit interiors to ISL. They bring light to your vision. And one last quick mention to make sure you register for the Monk Realty Summit 2020. Again, September 1st to September 3rd. Registration link is in the show notes.